I have gotten the question to explain 1844, so here goes. We start in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 8 prophesy the same things but with different symbols and with additional details. So Daniel's in vision here and he sees an animal. He sees a ram with two horns. One horn is slightly higher and bigger than the other. So this ram right here is the same nation prophesied by the bear in Daniel chapter 7 and by the chest and arms of silver in Daniel chapter 2. And the Bible tells us that nation is Medo-Persia. And the Bible says he was very powerful, conquered a lot of land, and yeah. Then the Bible tells us there was a goat that came after that with one massive horn on his head. Then those horns broke, four other horns came up in its place, and then out of those four horns came a little horn. Now, the Bible tells us that nation is Greece, and it tells us that little horn would come up out of the nation after Greece, and that was Rome. So again, in the Bible, watch my other videos, you can see that the horn represents a kingdom, or a king. So Greece was led by Alexander the Great. He conquered the known world within a short span of around, I believe it was 10 years. He had no heir and he died. His four generals took over his empire and divided it up. That was the Great Horn, which split into four horns. Greece was then conquered by Rome. Then we have a king of fierce countenance. In fact, the Bible says of this little horn power that he would go on to attack the truth of God. He would throw the sanctuary underfoot and trample it. He would throw the sacrifice of Jesus under the bus and just run over it. Basically, in other words, this little horn power is the same as the Antichrist, it's the same as the beast, it's the papacy. And they would throw the truth of the Bible, all the true doctrines of the Bible, under the bus and make people forget about them. But the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So, we have a time prophecy here. Now, according to Numbers 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel 4, verse 6, the Bible tells us that a day in Bible prophecy represents a literal year. So we have this 2300 day prophecy. Some people think it's a literal 2300 days, but according to the Bible, it's 2300 years. So when does it start? Well, Daniel chapter 9, 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be uh, this amount of time. It equals out to 483 years. However, if we read this first chunk right here, it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people upon thy holy city to make an end of transgression and to make reconciliation. You see, God was giving the people a last, final 490 years to get their act together. This was the nation of Israel that was left over and the Jews. Now remember, the Bible was not written with chapter and verse division, so this is just an explanation of Daniel 8.14. This 490 years is the first chunk of the 2300 year prophecy. Notice here in Daniel 9, that there are several key landmark events that tell us when these different prophecies will happen. Now the decree of the going forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, you can find that in Ezra chapter 7. God had given the people 490 years to get their act together, and in the last seven years is when Jesus showed up as Messiah. So we have the 483 years Jesus is anointed and baptized. We have Jesus baptized at that time. In the middle of that year, the Bible says right here, he would cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That happened three and a half years after Jesus was baptized. And then we have another three and a half years. People often take this last seven-year prophecy of their 490 years and apply it to the end of time. But if you do that, then you completely do away with the life, death, and ministry of Jesus. This is the only seven-year prophecy in the Bible, and it points to Jesus on earth, not to the end of time. And the Bible says here in Acts chapter 10 how that prophecy was fulfilled of Jesus being anointed and baptized. When Jesus was crucified, that's when the sacrifice and the oblation ceased. That's why Matthew 27 says the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. Now here's a visual graphic explaining all of those dates. Again, 457 BC is when the Jews were told they could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. 27 AD is when Jesus was baptized. 31 AD is when he was crucified. 34 AD is when he, uh, Stephen was stoned. Now if we take 34 AD, we still have 1810 years left. That takes us to 1844, and the Bible says that at the end of this 2300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. However, the Jewish temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD, I mean completely destroyed. Which is why Jesus said there would be no stone left upon another of the temple. And in 1844, there still is no Jewish temple on earth to cleanse, so there's only one other option. In Exodus 25, God tells Moses, build the sanctuary after the pattern I showed you. A pattern is a replica of the real thing. The book of Hebrews talks about how there's a temple in heaven. And in 1844, October 22nd, Jesus moved from the holy place of the heavenly temple to the most holy place. 
This is what the ancient Day of Atonement was meant to teach. You can read about that in Leviticus 16. The high priest was to go into the most holy place once a year and perform a work of cleansing. During that time, the people were to search their hearts, see were they holding on to any sins, confess it, repent. Anybody who did not do that was cut off from Israel. This was to teach us, as the Bible says in Revelation 22, 11, when Jesus leaves the most holy place of the heavenly temple, that means probation is closed for all humanity, and whatever you are, saved or lost, you are that for all eternity. Okay, we're going to pause right here, and we're going to go to part three. I'm going to post this on YouTube as well, so if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, just wait a few seconds. Now, this is part three of 1844, Made Simple. Jesus gave some warnings. Now, in Matthew 10, we see Jesus sending out the disciples. Remember, this is still that seven-year period where Jesus was trying to minister to the Jews and win them back to him. He's telling the disciples, don't go to the way of the Gentiles yet. Go to the Jews. Preach the gospel to Israel. But remember, we're still in that time period of a warning time period to the Jews. They had only a certain amount of time to get their act together. And here Jesus warned them. He says, look, if you guys don't get it together, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing the fruits thereof. There would come a time when the Jews would no longer be the chosen people. And as we mentioned earlier, in 34 AD, Stephen was stoned. That was the end of that 490-year prophecy. That was when the Jews became no longer the chosen people of God. And let's clear something up. To be the chosen people of God doesn't mean that you have any special genetics. It doesn't mean your ethnicity means anything. What it means is that God has chosen that group to share the gospel to the world. Israel's purpose for their whole existence, their whole purpose, was to share the gospel with the world, which they failed miserably to do. That's why God took the chosen status from them and gave it to the Christian church. In fact, in here in Galatians chapter 3, Paul says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Being a Jew, being a Greek, being whatever, doesn't matter. It, what matters is belonging to Jesus. Here in Romans 2, he says the same thing. Now, as far as the pre-advent judgment goes, what does it start at? Peter tells us that it starts at the people of God. Everybody who has ever claimed to be a Christian, you are going to be judged during the pre-advent judgment. You see, essentially the Bible teaches three phases of the judgment. You start with the pre-advent judgment. The Bible tells us that during the millennium, God's people will judge the wicked. And at the end of the millennium, that is the executive phase of the judgment when the wicked are consumed to ashes. They're not tortured for eternity. Ecclesiastes tells us that everything we do is going to be judged. And James tells us that that standard of judgment is the Ten Commandments. The good news, according to 1 John chapter 2, is that during the pre-advent judgment, we have it in the bag if we follow Jesus. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our judge. Jesus is the jury. If you have surrendered to Jesus, if you follow Jesus and love him with all your heart, you have absolutely nothing to fear during the pre-advent judgment. Because again, this verse tells us that Jesus is our advocate. He's our lawyer. John 5.22 says Jesus is our judge. And Revelation 3.14 says Jesus is the witness. He's the jury. If you are fully surrendered to Jesus, you cannot lose unless you choose to leave Jesus. Now, here's a short explanation, uh, kind of to end this study, of why that seven-year prophecy in Daniel 9 applies to Jesus from when he was baptized to the stoning of Stephen, not to the end of time. So here's my question to you. Are you ready for the judgment? Do you want to be ready for the judgment? All you got to do is surrender to Jesus and ask him to sanctify you. He will never turn away the contrite, serious soul.